just want to say hi to all visitors to this website. Thanks. So, we met two years ago, so what happened in the meantime? In the last two years? Yeah. I have been writing uh, two books. Yeah. Um, I have the new book, which is just just out. Um, yeah, we can. Camera up, yeah, hold the camera. Those the hardback. The two which we talked about last time. The, yeah. And last time, the newest one was just in preparation, and now it has come out here in Germany too. Yeah. Um, I, I did some interesting uh, research for um, Morgan Abyss to Tot. I think one of the scariest the, the, the novel is about the world traffic in human organs. Yeah. But um, I think the scariest bit of research I did was learning about police diving. I always used to think to be a police diver, you know, it was probably a nice, nice thing to have. You know, yeah. you, you got to swim around and flip, you know, with your fins on, look at fish, and occasionally pull up a dead body. Uh, and I discovered the reality is something different because in the book, early on in the story, a, a dredger, I don't know if you know the word in German, it's a boat that digs up the bottom of the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dredger pulls up a dead body and it's a teenager and when they do the post-mortem they find it's missing all its vital organs. And Roy Grace de decides that he should put a team of police divers out to sea and see if what else they might find in that same area. So I, I spoke to the police dive team and I said, you know, what would you do? And they said, what we'd do is we would scan the same area where the body was found. And if we see anything that looks like it might be a body, then we send a dive team down. And they said, would you like to come out with us? And I said, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> and you know, it's not smart. If you're going to go out on a dive boat, go out in the summer. This is February. <laughs> oh, yeah, that yeah. could be a little bit cold. Four seven gale blowing. Yeah. And they took with them this dummy called Eric, which replicates a human being. Yeah. And we went out 10 miles into the English Channel. I'm not sure why we had to go 10 miles, but I think they wanted to torture me. Anyhow. And then they threw Eric in, into about uh, 12 meters of water. And they then explained to me that almost everywhere that the police dive, there is zero visibility. Because they're diving in wells, in sewers, in canals which are full of supermarket trolleys and broken glass and wire. And the English Channel, the visibility is completely zero. Yeah. So bad you don't even take a torch. Uh, and what they do is, they, so they scan and they say, right, they, they, we, we see the shape of Eric on the ocean floor. They say, okay, in real life that might be a body, but it could be a, a bit of ordnance from the Second World War, an old torpedo or an unexploded bomb, so we don't know what it is. So they, have, they dive in pairs. Yeah. Um, the, the diver goes in full dive, dive rig and they drop a weighted line called a shot line down to the bottom and then he carries a 200 meter cable which is called a jack stay and he goes down to the bottom he's got a voice line and air pipe all the way down the bottom and when he hits the bottom he uncoils the rope and he puts the weight down one end and then he walks or swims 200 meters in complete darkness right? puts the other end down then he swims back holding it with one hand and he feels. <laughs> and if he doesn't find anything, he moves the cable one arm's length yeah. and goes back. And when he does find something, right, if it feels like a body, yeah. he then has to sit and hug it uh, because um, in case the current moves it away again. And he radios to the surface, speaks to the surface, and then his colleague comes down with an airbag because they don't try and move the body in case it's so rotted that the arm, the arm comes off or whatever. Now, he could be sitting there for half an hour what, for his colleague to come down. Anybody that's been down there for more than five or six days starts decomposing. And the moment they start decomposing, all the scavengers come. And anybody that's been down there 10 days is going to be completely covered, completely covered. Crabs, shrimps, the odd lobster, and he has to sit there with these things crawling all over here. Yeah. Right. It is the worst. It is it is the worst job I could imagine in a while. Yeah. And also, you don't often meet many police divers 
who eat seafood. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what that is. <laughs> so what, what do they do if, they, if there's just maybe the hat or an arm or leg down under there? Do they, do they find it as well or is it just lost because it's so dark and they don't see the, the shape from the top? From the top of the they, they're pretty thorough in the feeling, so, but they, they may find it. But if it was just an arm or a leg, quite possibly not. Um, because they have to do it all by fuel, so it's... And if, do you remember, there's a lot of mud, it would be stuck in it. I mean, it's, it's just the stuff of nightmares. It just... Uh, it sounds really... Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Mr. Tort is the last book that came out. It's about the urban trade. Yeah. And... Um, But in England, I guess that there's um, there's already come out in Dead Like You. Yeah, um, which so is when does it come out here? It's Dead Like You comes out here next year, ah. about this time next year, ah, okay. um, and that's They're a little bit late, a bit late here. one year because the translation takes the time. Ah. So <laughs> yeah, so with each book I write, I I like to take a a theme. Um, I mean with And Morgan Bisty Tot, it's about the world trafficking human organs. Dead Like You um, is about the subject of rape. Um, it's drawn from a, a very sinister true story um, about a guy who raped a series of women and took their shoes, and he only targeted women wearing stiletto, sexy stiletto heeled shoes. Um, but um, a Morgan Bisty Tot is. I mean, basically, the story revolves around a mother with a 15-year-old daughter, and the daughter is going to die if she doesn't get a liver transplant. And the mother panics that the system is going to let her down, goes on the internet and, and, and finds an organ broker uh, in Munich. And, Where else? Yeah. Well, actually, the, the, the world's biggest organ broker operates out of Berlin and is, 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 is female. So I, I moved it just from to me. And, and through this woman, she tries to buy uh, a new liver. And she gets told that this liver is going to come from, from a teenager who's killed in an automobile accident somewhere in the wild. Um, it's not until the morning that her daughter is going to be taken to the clinic for the operation that the police turn up and tell her that this isn't coming from somebody who's been killed in an organ accident. It's coming from a, a young um, Romanian girl who's been trafficked to England um, and is going to be killed for her liver that morning. And the mother has to make this terrible choice. Does she let this Romanian orphan die to save her daughter or does she let her yeah. daughter die? And that's the kind of heart of the, the story. And the idea of the book um, came to me a few years ago when I was sitting next to a documentary filmmaker called Kate Blewett at a dinner and she turned to me and she said do you know how much you're, you're worth in body parts and I said the way I've abused my body probably not, not a huge amount and she, do you really want to know yeah. <laughs> well you do want to know <laughs> because healthy young guy, you're worth a good million euros plus on the international black market. I could get, a, I could get about uh, 350, 400,000 euros for your heart, lungs, but the same for your liver, about 50,000 for each kidney. I think I'll keep me to myself. <laughs> This is the problem and what's happened is that in the last 20 years, as transplant techniques have got better and better, the supply of organ donors has gone down. And it's a really big irony that what's, what's caused the supply of organ donors to go down is that more people wear seat belts in cars. Oh, yeah. the, the, the perfect organ donor is someone who dies of a head injury leaving their body intact. Today, because people are wearing seat belts, they tend to die, less people are dying in cars. And when they do die, it tends to be because they're crushed or mangled. And so the transplant surgeons, um, transplant coordinators, 
are having to look further and further afield. Uh, I mean, there are in England, and it's the same in Germany. It's three people die every day waiting for an organ, and there's this very sinister world black market that that started up. Uh, it's specifically in China, India, uh, Colombia, uh, and some of the Eastern Bloc countries. Romania is one, one example, where people will literally get trafficked and killed for their organs. I, I actually went to Romania when I was researching the book. And I, I went to an orphanage in Romania and I met this 16-year-old girl and she'd uh, met this guy who said he could get a really good job in a, working in a bar in London and a nice apartment in London. I mean, you know, this is a street kid, has no sense of value. And she was told she had to have a medical examination. And she was given an injection, she was knocked out. And she had a scar down the side of her chest. And she'd had a kidney taken and didn't even know. So it, it, it goes on. I mean, there's, there's uh, Manila in the Philippines is known as one kidney island because you can get a package tour there <laughs> to either have a new kidney or actually a new liver as well. You know, all found, aftercare. This organ trade has been a problem for several years, I think, because I remember that in about 40 years ago there was an episode of the TV show CI5 The New Professionals, and they also had one episode that dealt with organ trade. So it's. it's yeah, it's been going on a long time. Yeah. I, mean, in, I mean, what then happened? This documentary maker, Kate Bleur, said to me that in Colombia, the police and the Colombian Mafia were working hand in hand and that the Colombian Mafia and some parts of Colombia were making more money out of trafficking humans for body parts than out of drugs. Um, typically what would happen is a kid would get arrested begging at the airport. A police officer who arrested him would sell him for like $50 to a crime family. The kid would then be put in an orphanage, be brought up, have a very nice life until he gets to 15, 16 or she he or she, and then somebody in America or somebody in Germany or somebody in England's daughter is going to die if she doesn't get a liver, and that kid literally will be killed. The liver will go to that family, the heart will go somewhere else. There are databases of people on the waiting list. And she sent, Kate sent two researchers to Columbia to look into this, and they were both murdered. And she said to me, she said, I'm, you know, I'm too scared to pursue this, but if you want to write it as a novel, I would support you and give you all my research material, and that, that was how the whole novel began. So, um, I guess the book you're currently working on is that in script? Yeah. Uh, can you give us some tiny insights about what it will be about? Sure. Do you want me to give you a bit of insight into uh, into Dead Like You first, the the, the shoe rapist one? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go on that one, then I'll come on to the next yeah. one. Because uh, Dead Like You is... Um, I'd always wanted to write about rape, because rape is the least solved crime of all the major crimes. The homicide clear-up rate in the UK and in Germany is 90%. Rape, it's about 2%. For a number of reasons, historically, one being the way that rape victims are treated, another being that it's very hard to get the evidence, um, because a lot of rape victims, unlike you see in the movies or reading books, don't fight back. They go passive. They think, I'll let him get on with it, maybe he won't kill me. And, and then what happens is he gets to court, and, and the defense lawyer says, well, she, he didn't have any scratch marks on, you know, she didn't have any flesh under her fingernails. It's obviously mutual consent. And it's kind of very hard to negate that. I then was at a police lecture um, and heard this extraordinary case history of a guy he, uh, in, in the north of England, in Yorkshire. He became known as the Rotherham Shoe Rapist. And between 1983 and 1987, he raped... Um, a series of women late at night outside bars and clubs he would take them into an alleyway he would tie them up and he would take their shoes and he only targeted women wearing sexy stiletto heel shoes and then in 1987 he stopped 
and the police lost the trail. From one day to the other? Yeah, just, just, yeah. Not uncommon, you get serial killers and serial rapists who will just suddenly stop. And, and sometimes they'll start again maybe years later. This guy stops. In, and then 16 years later, in 2003, the police, traffic police, stopped a woman who was drink driving in the um, middle of this town. And they breathalyzed her. And then they took a DNA sample, which is kind of routine and they found a, what's called a familial, which is a partial match to the rapist. And, and they went to see her and they said, do you have a brother? I have a brother, yeah. And she said, I have a brother. Um, she said, I have a brother and he's a very respectable businessman. And he was, he was 47 years old. He was a manager of a huge printing company. He was married, two kids who adored him. He was a pillar of his community. He was a Freemason. And his sister phoned him up and said, I've had a very strange conversation with the police. His reaction was to try to kill himself that night. He hung himself in his garage. Didn't, didn't die. Next day, the police raided his office. And under his desk, they found a trap door in the floor. And under that, they found 126 pairs of stiletto-heeled shoes, each wrapped in cellophane. And it was just a very chilling image for me. And I, 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 I sort of used that as the, as the basic starting point for, for my next book. And I drew from that. Uh, and that's Dead Like You. Uh, the follow-on to Dead Like You, which is Dead Man's Grip, uh, it actually starts with a, with a bad uh, accident. Um, my main character is uh, the mother of a 12-year-old boy. Her, fo her husband died six years earlier. She's gone out on a blind date. She's woken up with a hangover. <laughs> Disastrous date, man. Her son's playing the drums, and, and she has to drive him to school, and she has to go to work, and, and she takes him to school, and then she's late for work, so she's in a hurry, and she pulls out onto a road in front of a, a white van, deliberately. And, and the van's angry at her, and it flashes. And then her, her phone rings, and she looks down. She doesn't answer it, she, but as she looks back up, kid, teenager, comes out of a side turning on his bike on the wrong side of the road. She swerves and misses him just as she crashes into a yeah. wall. The van hits him and knocks him across the road and he goes under the wheels of a lorry coming the other way. And, and he dies at the scene an hour later. The police arrive. The woman is breathalyzed um, as is routine and she's over the limit from the night before. The van driver hasn't stopped. He's just disappeared. We call it a hit and run. And the lorry driver is uh, driving illegally and he's done too many hours. He should have stopped. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And then they do an ID on the, on the dead boy. And he's a student at Brighton University. And he's from New York. And the reason he's over in England is because he met this girl in New York from Brighton. And he's come. Oh, okay. yeah. His mother is the daughter of the New York Mafia godfather. Oh, she comes to England, she discovers the woman was drunk, the van driver's disappeared, and the lorry driver's out of hours, and she Doesn't goes, make him happy? I'm not happy. She decides she wants everyone involved in that accident killed. That sounds good. So, um, is it already finished, or...? Um no, I, uh, I need to have it finished by the end of October. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm two-thirds of the way there, but I have to go back and work like hell when I, after, after Frank Will you have it finished at the end of October? Close. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't, my publishers will kill me. And then I'll never get it finished. Yeah, that would be yeah. bad. So, um, last time you mentioned that you want to write um, some other novels in between. What happened to the idea? I, I know that you um, wrote a short book called um, The Perfect Murder. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it something like that that you talked about that you planned? Or do you... Yeah, I was planning that, yeah. And that's been, it's been a brilliant, it hasn't come out in Germany yet. But it's yeah. been very successful. It's, it's been an amazingly successful ebook. I think it's. Um, the biggest selling ebook in the English language at one point. But I'm not, but the other book I have been working on, a bigger book as a standalone, is a, a novel about designer babies, about a couple who go to a clinic and choose the genes of their child um, and, and the consequences of what happens from that. And that I hope will come out um, 
in England later next year and probably in Germany towards around this time and two years' time, I guess. Okay. So are you working on several books at the same time or are those just plans at the moment? That, that was a book I've been working on for about six years, so ah, okay. parallel. So, um, the Roy Grace, I, I, do every, have, I do one Roy Grace every year. Yeah. Um, after that book, yeah, I have I have other single books that, that I that I, that I want to write. I want to write something. I want to write a thriller book based about religion, which is going to be my next big project after that. I like always to have things that. I mean, my my main concentration is Roy Grace, but there's some issues that I want to write about that wouldn't work in a Roy Grace novel. Yeah, yeah. Certain themes, so I'm, I want to explore those in separate separate books. So I'm. Um excited to see it here. Maybe it does it. Does um, Perfect Murder come out here at the, the Fishing Chats? Yes, it will do. Um, I, and I'm not sure when yet. Um, probably sometime next year. Ah, okay. Yeah, maybe they'll... Uh, the Perfect Murder, the title comes from a... I asked the Chief of Police in Sussex yeah. if he believed there was such a thing as the Perfect Murder. And he, he said, yes. He said, it's the one we never hear about. And there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah, maybe, maybe they'll do an e-book here in Germany too. Yeah, I think Perfect Murder will definitely come out as, a, as an e-book. And I think Shirts, Fish of Alaga, are talking about e-books generally. Yeah. Um, I, I, But I think the problem here in Germany is that e-books are sometimes... Um, cost, they do cost more as the printed version. And um, I think they... they have to make it at least the same price as the printed version because of our we have a law that prohibits um, books being um, sold for a lesser price than uh, what the publisher says. Yeah, which I, I, it's really good you have that law yeah, because yeah, sure. I think it's actually helped enable independent booksellers yeah, sure. to do well. You know, in England we don't have that law. It, it benefits writers like me because um, if you like with discounting we can get massive volume sales but I think it hurts <laughs> it hurts the book trade ultimately um, we've had the similar problem with pricing in England with e-books um, and at the moment there's a big debate as to what price they really should be um, because they, they, they don't have the production costs that a printed book has but you've still got all the editorial costs and, and the marketing costs but I think that I mean, I, I had a book published by Penguin in 1994 on two floppy disks that was the world's first e-book. Um, so I've, I've had a kind of big interest in the subject. And I think that e-books have a place. I don't see them taking over from print. Um, not in my lifetime. I don't think in your lifetime. I think they will have a ceiling of around 15, 20% market share. They're very convenient for people traveling, um, they're, they're convenient for academics, but I still think you know, there's no greater pleasure than... Sure. You know, and this, this is probably the most durable piece of technology yeah. that ever got invented. You know, I mean, this, this has been around now for like 800 years, sure. and, and it still works. Yeah. Um, and it, it, you don't get on... I mean, one of the big, I think one of the big problems with e-books And I, you know, I got one of the first Sony e-readers, I got one of the first iBooks, uh, I have my books even on iPhone. Yeah. You get on an airplane, and, and the time you want, most want to read, particularly on a short flight, okay. is you know, taxiing, take off, where it's like half an hour yeah. where you can't have your book on, yeah, sure. and half an hour again when you're landing. So on a short flight, and you're going to maybe eat a sandwich or something, yeah. it, okay. so it doesn't work. Yeah. So you know, it has it has a kind of limited place. I mean, when they first came out, I got really excited because I'm I'm a avid reader, and when I go on holiday, I take a book a day and another five in case I'm hijacked. So I thought, great, you know, I can I can just take my my iBook iPad, and I don't have to carry 20 books. But it, it but it's flawed. It doesn't work that way. So you still take the books, and and I still you know I still like the smell. Of, smell of paper and that, that whole thing of I mean one of the worst things about iBooks is yeah here's my I'm, I can, you don't know what I'm reading 
That's true, yeah. Um, and, yeah and I think it's, it's kind of fun sitting on a train, looking and seeing that person. What are they reading? What are they reading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and it's actually a, it's a subtle form of advertising because you, in the course of a few days, you see a lot of people reading a particular book. You think, hmm, that must be a, maybe a good book. Yeah. And so you lose all that. I mean, and I guess you know, if you want to sit and look at porn at nine o'clock in the morning on the underground, <laughs> you can do it without anybody. <laughs> so, um, what happened to your career as a producer? Um, is it on hold because of your books? Because your last film came out in 2006, I think. Yeah, um, I I had to really make a decision um, because it got to the point where. I, I didn't have enough time to do both, and, and the, the choice for me was a no-brainer. I, I just love writing, and, and, and I like the, the thing with making movies is it's, what, what I liked about making movies is that it's the collaboration that you're working with a team. That was the thing. I, I, at one time, I didn't like about writing novels and you're on your own, very lonely. But actually, in the last, my, that's all kind of changed because I spend a day a week out with the police. Yeah, sometimes even more. I'm constantly traveling, like I'm here in Frankfurt. I was in Australia two weeks ago. I'll be in Canada in two weeks' time. Um, and, then, and then New York. So I'm on this constant sort of book promotion and travel, which actually I love. Because, you know, you meet your readers, you meet your publishers. And, and, I, and I just, I, I had to make a decision. And, 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 and with movies, although you get this collaboration, they're, they're very frustrating because you never end up with your vision on the screen. Yeah, sure. There's 20 people who know it's their movie. Yeah. You know, you have the director says, hey, it's my film. You have the producer say, actually, no, it's my film. Then the executive producer say, no, 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 it's our movie. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and then the director of photography says, look, this will be rubbish without me. And then you have four lead actors. Each one says, this is my movie. Yeah. And then the editor, and then the distributor, and, and the musician. And you, you just, every film is a fight. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I write a book, I don't have to change one single word. Sure. You know, I, I I will do because I listen to my editor, but I don't have to. And I love that fact that that's it's me and and, and, you know, and my readers, and there's nothing between us. So I won't I won't um, I don't plan to make any more movies other than <laughs> keeping a very strong eye on, on the Roy Grace television shows when that goes into production in uh, some months' time. But I think that a lot of from writers, because I appreciate some years ago I talked to Jean-Christophe Cranger, the author of The Crimson Rivers, I don't know if you know that, but he also wrote the scripts of the screenplays of the films. There's the film with Jean Dino from The Crimson Rivers that he wrote the screenplays at first himself, but then he with that because there were too many people who wanted to have a say in that then. Yeah, it's always the same. Yeah, it's it's a strange business, the movie business. It's a, it's a you know, massive ego business too. You know, you're forever having to, if you, you know, you, if you want a leading actor or a leading actress that's a big name, you've got to really you know, almost wipe their ass for them. Or tell them they're wiping it beautifully themselves. So we're talking about movies and television. Which crime shows do you like yourself? If some at all. They almost all irritate me because I'm a stickler for research and detail. And I get so angry when I, when I see... Yeah, I, I'm a, most police officers don't watch crime shows. And the reason is their wives can't stand them shouting at the screen. <laughs> or, or if they're women police officers, their husbands can't stand them shouting at the screen. Because you see a crime scene. Now, yeah, there's somebody murdered. Now, in, and, and, and the next thing is you see a bit of crime scene tape. Yeah. And then the senior investigating officer turns up in his coat and his outdoor shoes. Yeah. Everyone else is in their protective clothing and he walks all over. And it, and it kind of gives the impression that, that a crime scene, these soccer guys, these crime scene investigators, wear these clothes to stop themselves getting dirty. Yeah. <laughs> 
it was actually they were aiming to stop them contaminating the crime scene and uh, and an English this a major crime scene let's say a murder scene the first policeman there the first policeman there first thing he does is seal it off and, and the reason he's doing that is so that as much of the evidence that's there remains there and, and isn't trodden into the ground or isn't contaminated by new evidence and he is then empowered to stop anyone going through that tape, even the chief of police, unless they're wearing protective clothing. It's, it's kind of details like that, and I think they're important details in, to get the authenticity. And I, I find so many crime shows are so lazy about that. There's a show in England called The Bill, which, which occasionally does get it right, but some often does not. So I, I, I tend to watch the reality ones much more. I like the kind of the, the cameras and the cop cars. Um, I find very few actual cop shows. I mean, crime scene CSI and stuff. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun occasion to watch an episode, but. You know, within 10 minutes I'm screaming, no, you can't get DNA in four minutes. Or <laughs> and, and what I think intrigues me about... Um, the other thing you see, every time you see a cop drama, they're always arguing with each other. Sure, yeah. yeah. I've spent an average maybe of a day a week in, a, with, in the company of police for maybe the last decade in police stations, at crime scenes, in cars. I have not, in 10 years, seen two police officers argue. It's, it's a military hierarchy. You know, they don't argue. It's, they might dislike, have dislikes and likes, and there might be sort of political machinations, but they work on an investigation in a spirit of cooperation. It just doesn't happen. And, and that, it's, it's like a sort of, oh, well, we better create some dramatic conflict, so let's have this this guy argues with that and it, 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 it's so unreal that to me so that's another thing that makes me shout at the screen <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, you just mentioned that you're constantly in tune with police and how often do you do that and what is it like is it just a day of observing or how, how can we imagine such a day It really varies um, what's going on. Like when I went out in the dive boat, so I'm kind of dive boat. I've, I've actually got hands-on involved. Um, one time um, we had to arrest this. I was with two officers and, and had to go to a break-in. And a burglar had run off. And, and one officer stayed with the, the, the guy. And the other officer I went with in the car and saw the guy. And he, and he said, give me a hand, with you? And... Uh, <laughs> Stop the car, and I had to. So I was holding on the boat. I'm going. Actually, I'm a writer. <laughs> and then I had a great. This is a classic. About a year and a half ago, I was on patrol in Brighton at about 10 o'clock on, on a Thursday night. And in Brighton, I'm with two York police officers. There was a a young sergeant and a young Indian woman police officer, very inexperienced. And it's illegal in Brighton to drink in the streets. Yeah. You, you cannot have an open bottle or an open beer can. And we were in a rough area of, of Brighton, 10 o'clock at night, and 10 guys walking down the street, all, they, all drinking. So they pull over the car and get out. And they confront the guys and they say, sorry guys. And these were not nice guys. They were really, they were, they were drunk, they were hostile. They started shouting at the police. They started shouting racist taunts at this Indian woman. And they were saying, you come and try and take off. Um, it was turning really ugly fast. And the police radioed for backup. But where we were, it could take 20 minutes on a busy, busy night. And I could, I could see it was going to turn into a fight. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, do I get... I'm, I'm standing behind the two cops in my yellow police jacket with my notepad, as, as is normal. And I'm thinking, do I get back in the car? <laughs> uh, do I run? <laughs> Or do I stay and fight? And I'm thinking, the only way I can gain respect is if I stay and fight. And, and I used to box when I was a kid. So I think, right, I'm going I'm to stay and, and help my, my friends. And then one of the thugs points to me and he says, who the fuck's he? 
right? And the sergeant says, he's with the FBI. And they, they all backed off. They became like little kissy cats. They handed over their bottles. I thought respect. So that's the kind of typical of an incident that kind of can happen. Um, other times I go sometimes like with them, um, I went recently on a drug raid, they, they, they raided three apartments in a, in a block and they didn't have any press with them because they didn't, and they asked me to go with them to take photographs, <laughs> standing at the front with my little camera. Um, or I'll go to, they'll tell me, um, there was recently a, a horrible serial killer in England and he buried a lot of, he raped women and murdered them and buried them under the floors of places he'd lived in and he'd had two houses in Brighton and the police were digging up the basement um, and, and I went down and watched some of the digging there and, and, and saw some of the evidence. So it really varies and, and when, I'm, when I'm working on a novel, like when I was writing Dead Like You about the serial rapist in Brighton, there was a, a police officer I knew who was actually working on a case of a, a, a guy who was a serial offender attacking women late at night. So I was, he was able to walk me through and I was out on their investigation and learning a lot that was helpful in the writing of the book. So all these, with these tours to the police are also the main events where you get your ideas for your books? Not always, but, but, but quite a bit. Um, like, certainly with Dead Like You came exactly from, from, from the book. But in fact, um, Dead Man's Grip, the Mafia book, is the other way around. Um, I had this idea for this story. And I, I know, I have a very good relationship with two police officers in New York. And I, I worked with them when I wrote um, my, this novel about 9-11. And these two guys had spent the last 35 years busting the Mafia. And I was having dinner with them last year in New York. And they said, you know, what are you, what are you writing about next? And I told them a story I, I told you a little bit earlier about, the, about the, the mother and the two guys, the lorry driver and the van driver, and, the, and this teenage kid is killed. And, and, and he's the son of, uh, he's the grandfather of the New York godfather. And they looked at me and they said, you know this happened. <laughs> and, I walked, what? and it was uh, John Gotti, who was the New York, was the New York Godfather, um, died in jail, got a 37-year jail sentence. And his, about 25 years ago, his four-year-old son was playing in the street in Brooklyn, and a drunk neighbor ran him over and killed him. And his wife went loopy and said, I want that guy dead. And two weeks later, he disappeared and the police know that he was tortured and killed. So that was kind of slightly... <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's, a, it's a creepy coincidence. Yeah, very, and I, you know, I'd never read that or anything, so it was just... Uh, so they say truth being stranger than fact being fiction. Whatever. What did they say? Fact is stranger than... Truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. yeah. So... Last question. I just have to ask because I read on your Twitter some days ago that you that during these touring car races, uh, how does it happen? Are you, are you, have you been doing that for a longer time, or are you new to that? Or how does it happen? Yeah, I've been racing for about seven or eight years. Um, and then this year, I've been, uh, I, I was racing kind of by and large smaller cars like two CV Citroens. And then this this last year, I um, a friend of mine bought uh, a British touring car, Honda, works Honda. It was the one that was raced by Tiffany Dow, a guy from Top Gear. Um, Honda built, um, I think, six of these for the British Touring Car Championships, and, and, and a friend of mine bought it secondhand and said, did I want to share it with him? And I said, yeah. And I've just come this weekend. I've just done, I'm still, I'm aching, because I've been done a 24-hour race at Silverstone. Um, and the power steering wasn't working, and so I, was, I love driving. That's how it comes to Germany. I love driving so, uh, here. Are those your own cars? Then? Yeah, that's that's uh, sharing that one with, with uh, a friend of mine. Yeah, and so we, we I was driving two hours on, four hours off. So I did from four to six, four to six in the afternoon, and then uh, one o'clock in the morning to three o'clock, <laughs> then uh, eight a.m. till ten a.m. I think it was. 
It's such good fun. What I like, it's the only thing that I do where I actually relax. It may sound strange, but if I sit on a beach, I'm thinking about my book. Uh, okay. Yeah, if I go skiing and I'm going up the ski lift, I'm thinking about my book. Yeah, but, but when you're in your car, you can't think about it. You do not, you, you know, you, 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 you're doing, a, you know, 180 kilometers an hour coming yeah. towards the next bend. I start thinking about the book. I'm going through to the grandstand. And that will be so, it, so it, good, it's yeah. a real relax for me. It's, it's yeah. a, it's a, it may sound bizarre, but also, I think sitting still, writing, it's very sedentary. I kind of like this adrenaline rush. Yeah. And also, racetrack is one of the friendliest places. I think not at Formula One level, but I think at amateur level, which we're at. Everybody helps everybody. Yeah. You know, we were sharing a gar pit garage at Silverstone with, a, with, a, with an Aston Martin works team. Yeah, and they helped drill some holes for us, and you know, we gave them some soup. It's a sort of there's a real nice yeah. friendship. You know, everybody does it because they love cars. But I think my agent would rather I took up something Probably. You know, gardening or <laughs> Probably. I had a big smash last year and uh, I was doing about it's always, it was filmed on YouTube actually you can see it on my website okay. if you go on my blog and it was I was doing about yeah you know, I was doing about 110 kilometers at the time and, uh, and um, the first thing my beloved heard about it was um, was on, it was it, some, there was a quiet news day, so it was on the radio that, uh, that I'd been in this bad smash. So she was in absolute panic. I, I got out, it was, wasn't even a miracle, not, not even hurt, but, but it shook me up a bit. Yeah. Uh, but in a racing car, that could be really bad. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, modern race cars and modern safety, even with old cars today, you have strong safety cages yeah. and, and plumbed in fire extinguishing, so the, the actual the injury rate is, is, you know, you meet people, you know, you're, I've, I've met quite a few guys who've had, you know, broken this, broken that, but fortunately the actual sort of death, is, death rate is pretty pretty small, it tends to be kind of freak accidents because it's, it's not like the roads, I mean, the, I mean the most road accidents technically when you've got two cars coming the other way at each other, you know, at least on a race circuit you'll tend to be going most of the time we're in the same direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I guess that's it for today. It was a great pleasure again. You, that was likewise. It's always fun talking to you.